Welcome to the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top founders and experts in the e-commerce industry and take an in-depth look at the struggles and successes in growing e-commerce brands profitably. Josh Chen here. I'm the host of the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top experts and entrepreneurs in the e-com industry, and we go behind the scenes of the struggles and successes in growing a brand. Now, this episode is brought to you by Kronos Agency. If you run a direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand that is ready for next-level scale and to double your customer lifetime value through lifecycle marketing, Kronos is your company. We've helped hundreds of brands scale profits with email, SMS, and mobile push while getting, getting an average of 3,500% ROI from our efforts. We've worked with brands like Truly Beauty, Elias Skin, Dr. Living Good, and many more. Now, the next step is to email us at sales at chronos.agency, or you can go to chronos.agency to learn more. Today's guest is someone really, really special. Um, Kara Golden is the founder and CEO of Hint Inc., best known for its award-winning Hint Water. I actually have a ball of it right here. Uh, the leading unsweetened flavored water. She has received numerous accolades, including being named EY Entrepreneur of the Year 2017, Northern California, and one of InStyle's 2019 Baddest 50. Uh, previously, Kara was VP of Shopping Partnerships at America Online, more commonly known as AOL. She hosts the podcast, The Kara Golden Show. Her first book, Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, uh, was released in uh, October just last year in 2020, and is now a Wall Street Journal and Amazon bestseller. Kara lives in the Bay Area with her family. Kara, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, let's, uh, let's dive straight into it. Uh, my, you know, my uh, first, I guess the, the first time we met, or rather I met you was when you were on stage uh, back in Boston at Clavio. Boss, I believe 2019. Yeah, um, that's and right. And you headlined that event. It was incredible. Um, you talked about your story and how you came to be an entrepreneur. And I think you had you have a really unique path that you took that isn't um, isn't exactly conventional. And um, you're definitely not conventional. Nothing about you <laughs> is conventional. Um, so tell me a little bit about your first job um, as a buyer for a toy store uh, written in the book. How has that shaped you and who you are today as an entrepreneur? Oh, thank you. Well, it's it's so funny. I I actually got my first job when I was 14 years old. I was uh, the last of five kids and my brothers and sisters, uh, you know, all, all older, all had jobs and little jobs and income. And I wanted that. And so I walked into a local toy store and, uh, of course, a kid myself. And uh, the, the woman who owned the toy store said to me, would you ever want a job here? And I said, sure, right? I'm 14 years old. And she said, would you like to do the cash register? What 14-year-old doesn't want to do the cash register, right? I'm thinking money. I mean, it, it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, so initially, I started just doing it on Sundays, and then uh, that was an after-school job. It was pretty great. Uh, what I didn't know going into it was that I would learn so much around business. And I started to, for example, I would have people come in, and I would recommend, they would say, I have a nephew that is 14 years old, and I need to get him a gift. What should I get him? And so I would have two or three things on the top of my, uh, on the tip of my tongue that I would say, okay, go get that. Go get Legos, right? And this is the Lego set that you should get him. And what I realized was that I was kind of saying the same thing over and over again, and it was pretty successful. So that part was great. But then my boss said to me, don't push that product so much because the margins aren't as high. And I thought, gosh, that 
you know, I didn't really, I mean, I knew what margins were, but I didn't really understand it. And so I said, can you explain a little bit more to me? And so she told me about the different margins in different categories. And so then obviously I looked for other categories that had higher margins. I remember going home for dinner that day and saying to my parents, gosh, I learned so much about margins today. And they said, margins? And I and I explained everything about these different categories. And you know, it's so funny because I think there's a lot of stories in, in uh, just in that little story there. When, first of all, when you actually aren't afraid to show what you don't know, right? You, you kind of show your authentic shelf, self, your vulnerability, I mean, that's when you'll be able to learn a lot more, right? Obviously, I knew what the term margin was, but just actually sharing with them that I didn't really understand what the context was of margins and how it related. And, you know, that's something that I think back on even in running my own business today, that obviously there's different ways to do business. There's e-commerce and direct-to-consumer. There's also, you know, dealing with retailers and different types of retailers, whether it's specialty retail or Costco. I mean, very, very different margins. So it all went back to that little toy store story. (laughs) That's incredible. Yeah. You you have um, kind of, as I, so I, kind of throughout the book and kind of your journey, a common theme has been persistence and perseverance. And that also landed you your job at Time Magazine. Um, Interestingly, tell us about that story and kind of how persistence remained a theme throughout. Yeah, another interesting story. So when I got out of university, I was a journalism major. I was a minor in finance. I thought, I'm going to go and get a job at a publication called Fortune Magazine, which used to be up until recently under the same umbrella as Time Magazine and as well as Sports Illustrated and People Magazine and some other pretty well-known publications. And uh, I was living in Arizona at the time on the West Coast of the US. And I decided that I would uh, get on an airplane and invest in myself and go to New York and try and figure out how I could get an interview at Time Magazine or, at, or excuse me, at Fortune Magazine. Well, when I wrote a letter to the managing editor of Fortune Magazine, that's when he wrote me a very nice note back uh, that said, if you're ever in the New York area, definitely let me know. And I'd love to meet you because I showed my enthusiasm. I showed why I wanted to get into, uh, why I wanted to get into Fortune Magazine and, and be a writer, but he wasn't committing. But I thought I might as well just go and go to the HR office and see if I can't get an interview. Well, when I showed up there, that's when I, I'll never forget, I, I showed up in the HR office and I walked up to the receptionist and I said, I'm here to see Marshall Loeb, who was the then managing editor of Fortune Magazine. And I pulled out my letter that he had written to me. And this poor woman had no idea what to do with me. And so she reached out to her boss and said, there's this you know, crazy woman who, who was standing in front of me who says she has a meeting with Marshall Loeb. And I don't know, I, I don't know that she does, but I don't have it on the books. And so the head of HR said, actually, Marshall uh, can't meet with you. I think what he meant is maybe you could let him know in advance if you're ever coming out. And and I said, gosh, that's too bad. I'm leaving tomorrow. But is there any other roles that might be good for me? And she said, like, what? And I said, anything. I'll do anything to work in this building. And she said, you know, I've got a role as an executive assistant in circulation. And I don't know if you know, you probably know what an executive assistant is, but you may not know what circulation is. And to me, it seemed, you know, like a foreign language. I had no idea, but I said, yes. I said, sure. Right? What's the worst that could happen? I go and and learn a little bit. I'm already there in the building and I get to have one interview. You never know what would happen. And that's when I 
ended up having the interview. It was at Time Magazine. And uh, I don't even think I actually knew what circulation was. And even when I got the job offer and took the job, but I thought, I'll learn. I'll learn what circulation is. And circulation is actually a uh, it, 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 the easiest way to describe it is the blowing insert cards that go into magazines where there's offers, where they talk about subscriptions and lifetime yes. value. This was the early 90s. I mean, this is when I was learning about the price difference between um, how a consumer would respond to an offer that was eight months versus 11 months versus 13 months versus oh, wow. um, putting in a, uh, at, we worked closely at Time Magazine with Sports Illustrated. We used to have a sneaker phone that we would give out with subscriptions and how people would respond to that like a free thing versus a, you know, an extension on their subscription. And so all of these little things, I think back now as really the, the bones of what direct-to-consumer is today. And so often I think back on that experience, again, a lot of lessons, showing up and saying yes, right? When somebody gives you an opportunity, what's the worst that could happen? You could always leave, right? They could all they could fire you, right? If they don't think it's the right match for whatever reason. But I thought, gosh, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to be in the building working on the brand that I think is just so awesome. Maybe eventually I'll get to Fortune Magazine, which by the way, I never did. But I every day I would wake up motivated and excited to go and learn something. And then one day I actually ended up getting a call from another media brand that had just started out called CNN. And it's crazy to think back that CNN was a late stage startup back then. It wasn't wow. a tiny startup, but Ted Turner was still running around the office. And it's I remember crazy. you know, getting this opportunity to go for an interview and it was he was working he had this idea for the airport channel when you go inside of airports and you see these monitors and how do you sell advertising and he knew that i had been working on some airline circulation for uh time magazine and some other publications and so he was like do you think you could actually do this job and help get the monitors into airports i had zero experience doing any of it but i thought wow it's really interesting sure I mean, what's the worst that could happen? I just, you know, I go try. No one's ever done it before. So it's not like I'm going to be compared to somebody else. Instead, I need to just try and I need to figure out what are the steps in order to do that. And anyway, ended up helping with that, which was super exciting. And um, anyway, I just, I, I think there's a, uh, there, there's a lot of, again, a lot of lessons just in looking back on on kind of history and, and what I learned. I didn't know, for example, when I was at CNN, we didn't call things a late stage startup. All I knew yeah. that was that Ted Turner wore a suit and cowboy boots, which I had never seen anyone do that before. And he was heard, a little yeah. crazy and a little out there, and but he was making it happen and he was funny right and he was just and he he was just going for it and a lot of people we would ultimately i ended up also then going into just national sales at CNN and i remember you know going up against the big networks like ABC and NBC and everybody thought what are you guys crazy i mean how are you going to compete against these big national networks and Again, being driven and led by a leader that believed, that said, you just have to keep showing up. You just have to keep moving forward and making progress every single day. Even if you, you go back two steps, tomorrow you're going to go forward three steps and we're going to keep doing this and we're going to keep doing this. So little did I know that even taking that first job at at time, would that lead me to be able to really have kind of my first um, first step into the startup world? I'm, I'm starting to see a narrative of kind of little life lessons that eventually kind of shaped who you are today, Kara. It, it's little things that kind of uh, happened along the way. And 
I, I think it's documented incredibly well in the book that you wrote on Undaunted. And I, I guess, you know, my, where I'm really curious about from just from a selfish point of view is I'm really new to business and working in general. So my business and, uh, and Kronos is just, uh, le- we're, we're less than four years old. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the lessons that we take away are often obviously so much clearer on hindsight, but at the moment it might seem, it always seemed like, well, a, an incredibly daunting task, like a problem to fix. Mm-hmm. But in, in the back of my mind, I, I know that like 10 years down the road, a year down, I'm going to look back at this as a lesson that shaped who I am today. What's your advice for someone like me going through you know, problems that might seem incredibly difficult and hard every single day? Um, what's the best mindset that I can have or what can I do? Yeah. So I, you know, it's interesting. I think the world of entrepreneurship, I, I best like to visualize it this or visualize it in this way. So I think about it as a puzzle and that somebody gave you a very large puzzle and said, please go do this puzzle on the table. It has I think a thousand pieces, something like that. And so you start to build out this puzzle and then suddenly you can't figure out what the other pieces are that go in. So maybe you take a break for a minute. Then you come back and somebody says, oh, I'm actually going to take a handful of the pieces away. And so you can't even have these pieces anymore. And you're like, what? What? Wait, you can't do that. I was, I was getting back. I was getting traction. I was getting back to work. And they said, well, you don't need those anyway. So just keep building because you're not going to be able to be successful in building this puzzle any, anyway. But you don't stop. You keep adding on to the puzzle and hoping that you do have all of the puzzle pieces. And then somebody, somebody new comes in and then they throw a bunch of new puzzle pieces down and they say, here's some of the puzzle pieces that I think were taken away from you, but there's a bunch of new ones too. It might actually belong to the puzzle over on the next table, but that's okay. You'll figure it out. And that, that is the story of entrepreneurship right that you you sit there and look at the puzzle and you try every single day and you keep going and you don't stop because complacency is ultimately what will end it for you right you're that will you cannot say well i didn't have all the puzzle pieces or right you're you don't turn into being a blamer of why you can't an go and accomplish it right instead say, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep trying. And you know what? Maybe the puzzle that you have actually gets divided, right? Into two different pieces. Maybe like you have to be open to where it's going. All you can do though, is do what you can do and continue to learn and continue to make progress. And I think that along the way, what I've learned is that the persistence, yes, and and uh, you know resilience and and all of those things are important. But I think more than anything, it's this curiosity and this willingness to actually keep going when other people say you should really give up. You don't have all the puzzle pieces. How are you going to do this? And you, it's not that you don't listen to them. You hear them, but you just don't absorb it, right? Because I think that that's the difference between great entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that give up, don't make it, however you want to view it, is that they they decide that this is a choice, right? That they're making to just keep putting some kind of effort towards it. And as long as they continue to make progress, as long as their curiosity keeps coming up with What if we did it this way? What if we did it this way? No matter what happens along the way, that is the most critical thing that I see in entrepreneurs. And one other thing that I'll say is that 
the best entrepreneurs know that they cannot do it on their own. They have to bring in a team. So just because you've got a great idea, I always say ideas are a dime a dozen unless you actually have a team that could go and execute. Now, the best teams are not necessarily the most experienced. What is consistent in every single industry is that they all have curiosity, right? That they just keep going. And the more people that you can have that want to build a puzzle with you, that keep going. And when you see that you've got somebody on your team who's saying, that's impossible, we should stop, then that is the moment when you have to figure out, do they stay and you convert them into being a puzzle doer or do they leave, right? Because I think that that, that, that kind of energy in, in a startup, in a, you know, newish company, and even frankly, in an older company is also what will kill it. It, it sound, it's starting to sound like that uncertainty doesn't go away at any it stage. Doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I think it's just, and that's the thing that I also learned just from, you know, working directly for or, you know, in the organization of other startups, including Ted Turner, Steve Jobs, Steve Case, is that you keep, you, you keep adding to the puzzle. You keep finding ways to solve, a, solve the question, what can we do? Because sometimes it's not that you don't have goals. Goals are amazing to have. But as I always say, it's best to leave the goals on a shelf that is a little hard to reach, right? You see it, but it's not like you can go and pull it down every single day and hold on to it. Instead, go and figure out what are those things, what are those steps that will help you to move it forward a couple, a couple, you know, pillars in some way. And then the, tomorrow, what are those steps? What are those steps? And then look back and say, well, I've actually made this much progress on it. And I'm that much closer to that goal. But don't sit there and look at that goal every single day because that is not what gets you to the goal. That that goal will get you frustrated. Instead, look at the progress that you make along the way. That's such good advice. And um, I, you know, I I am uh, I'm, I'm a firm believ- believer of the, the the fact that who we are is largely shaped by who we surround ourselves with and the people that we are fortunate enough to come uh, across. Um, so in, in the book, you mentioned John McCain. Uh, he was an early influence on your life and your philosophy in business and in life. Um, tell us about that story and what, who are some other early influence, influencers in your life? Yeah, well, John McCain, uh, he was, when I started working for him, he was actually a representative. He was in Congress in, in the state of Arizona. And I started working for him when I was in high school and a little bit later than my toy job. Um, and it was not very many hours a week initially when I was in high school. And then he actually ran for the other half of uh, a congressional job, the Senate. And so I continued, I went to school in Arizona and I continued to work, uh, work in his office. And, you know, I remember when I actually got the job with him, my last interview in high school for um, being able to have an internship with him, uh, he interviewed everybody uh, who came into the office and he said, so tell me why you want to have this job. And I said, so my parents are Republicans, and I want to know whether or not I'm actually a Republican or if I'm only a Republican because I'm born a Republican. And he started laughing, and he said, that is the most honest answer I have ever heard. And of course, I'm you know just a kid, right? And I'm just saying whatever's on my mind, but I got the job. And you know, I remember seeing him in the hallway, and he would say to me, uh, he said, so have you changed your mind yet? I, has it, uh, you know, how do you feel about it now? So many, you know, fond memories of, of you know, working in his office. And, uh, you know, probably the most challenging one 
for for me personally was when uh, there was a, a federal law suggestion, I should say, that Martin Luther King Day be um, be recognized by every single state. And the state of Arizona, including John, actually voted to not recognize it. It was one of the few states that voted to not recognize Martin Luther King Day. And I one day was in the office and I said, uh, Mr. McCain, may I ask you a question? And he said, sure. And I said, so why is it that you voted against actually recognizing John or, or recognizing Martin Luther King Day, MLK Day? And he said, uh, well, Kara, he said, someday, and you'll learn this over time, is that you have to agree to uh, disagree on things. Obviously, he knew that I was disagreeing with him. And he said, and it doesn't mean that the people are bad people, but they may think differently than you did. And I kept, I, I knew enough to know that I couldn't argue with him at this point. But I have to say that it sat with me as something, it was like a mark on him in my mind thinking, you know, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is a little bit strange. So I went on with my life, right? I left uh, university and obviously moved to New York and started my career. And I remember in, not till much later, in 2012, he was on television, I think CNN, talking about something that he really regretted. And he talked about voting against Martin Luther King Day and how that was such a massive mistake. This is 2012. I mean, it was, wow. it, you know, so many years later. And I said, uh, I remember just thinking, you know, that, that sometimes people will actually um, disagree with you, right? You, you, like John said, you've got to agree to disagree with you. But the, the best thing is when they actually come around to their senses and they realize that what they did wrong and they own it, right? And that's what John McCain was doing. He was owning that he was wrong. Should he have voted earlier to recognize it? A thousand percent. But the fact that he actually owned that he made a major mistake, I thought that is a good human. That's very cool. How, how do you start to find good influences in your life early on? Or, or rather, how do you, is there a way to manufacture you know, an environment like that? It's a good question. You know, I think just staying curious and, and doing what is really interesting to you. I think for me, to, you know, I didn't know that much about government. I obviously in grade school was taking, you know, government classes. And I knew some people who uh, worked for John McCain and sort of other representatives. But I think that the best way to learn is to kind of face your fears, right? In and in some way, not that I was super fearful of it, but I was I was interested in going in and, and kind of, you know, put me in the game, right? That I, I thought, I wonder if I can go and get a job to learn a little bit more. And I think when you have that hands-on experience, even, you know, the hands-on experience around margins in a toy store that I talked about earlier, it's just, you know, those, it, the dots eventually connect, right? You, you eventually start to, to see how all of these different pieces that maybe you've been schooled in actually come together. And that was the thing for me. I mean, I think, you know, working in any kind of government role, I always suggest it to um, to anybody if you get an opportunity to do that, because it just starts to make a lot more sense to you, right? No matter, you know, what you end up doing, and maybe you don't do it long term, I just think it's something that so many people can benefit from, because you just really are able to kind of follow what's going on. And I think that, obviously, uh, any type of, you know, government is, um, you know, has a has a major role in every single country and trying to really understand how that impacts you uh, is just it is incredible. So stay curious. Um, always be on the lookout for new ideas, be open minded and agree to disagree. Absolutely. Um, Kara, you're a big reader. I know that. 
now boring from the tim ferris show um this is a question that i really love what is a one book that you've gifted the most aside from your own book uh, and why that i've gifted the most um I'm looking down to see if I can grab it right here, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. Uh, let's see. Gonna, my pile is falling down. Uh, do you know Guy Kawasaki? Mm-hmm. Fam um, famous so investor, yeah. Wise Guy. Have you read this book? I have not. It's a great book. It's, uh, and I've gifted it uh, multiple times. So Guy... Very interesting uh, individual. I've known Guy actually for years. Um, I can't say super well, but he had started back in the 90s, um, kind of the first, almost like a, a, you know, Y Combinator type of environment uh, where um, incubator think tank type of uh, type of environment. And uh he had actually, prior to that, worked for Steve Jobs. He was one of the original, um, I think, five guys that worked there. But he has so many life lessons on uh, on really growth and and uh, and just things that are important along the way. And and anyway, I just think he's an incredible person. So I've had him on my podcast uh, a couple of times actually, and he's got his own podcast as well. But he's just this very incredible, very real person that has had really great experiences. He actually worked for Apple twice. He was fired by Steve Jobs. And, uh, and then Steve tried to hire him back, which is just a story in and of itself. And, you know, he's just a really interesting guy. And, uh, and just a lot of what he's learned um, about not only diversity and being an underdog and, and figuring out what you really want. Um, also figuring out you're only as old as you think you are. I think he started <laughs> surfing at age 55 or something. I mean, wow, just, okay. Yeah. Like he's just, and then he decided cool. he wanted to actually, I knew I've known him for years, but I didn't know this really great story that's in there that he, uh, started surfing and he became really passionate about it. And then he wanted to meet this incredible surfer that he, you know, kept thinking about. And, uh, and then one day he was in a coffee shop in LA and, uh, the, and he met him and he, and he said, can, is there any way we can go surfing together? And, and they did. And so, you know, he talks about, you know, think about those, what's your wish list? What do you want to do? You know, even if you think that it's so far out there, right? It, just go for it. Have it on a little, you know, sheet of paper and figure out exactly what you want to do. Now I'm definitely going to get that book. Um, yeah, it, it's a great one. Fast read like mine, but he, it's uh, actually we go back and forth. He's he uh, actually he was funny. I asked him to pre-read my book and uh, he's kind of, you know, it was pretty scary to uh, get a few people that I got to read my book. I, I shot high and I figured I would hear back from a few of them that they wouldn't actually put their name on my book, that they enjoyed it. Um, and Guy was one of them where he reached out to me. And this is a really funny story. And Guy said, uh, he said, so I read your book and I have a quick question. And he said, why don't you call me? And I thought, oh no, you know what? Like, what's he going to say? Right. It was really <laughs> scary. And he said, so why would any entrepreneur read your book? And I thought, well, that's not a very nice thing to say, right? And he said, <laughs> I mean, you had some incredible challenges along the way. And he said, why would they read your book? And I said, because I did it right? And I got out of those gnarly zones, right? Where, and, and I want people to know that being an entrepreneur is a choice. It's not, you can go and make a lot more money and other jobs and you can go and find, you know, find jobs that are going to pay you that, you know, maybe you don't have the fears that you have as an entrepreneur and those adrenaline days and those setbacks and those doubts. 
But if you really set your mind to it, that you can actually go and build something and build something with a mission and purpose that helps lots of people like my product hint. And he said, okay, I'm in. And it, it, it was just, I, and I thought, that was easy. But again, it's, uh, you know, you never know what people are going to say. And he's, uh, he's incredible. He's actually interviewed me a couple of times for some uh, fireside chats as well. He's a, he's a great guy. So highly recommend that book and him. And also highly recommend reading Undaunted. Uh, guys, listening, Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. Uh, you got some amazing, amazing um, names on the back of your book right, right here. Cheryl Sandberg, Jamie Dimon, John Legend, Adam Grant, um, big names and really easy read. And I think everyone should get a copy of this available on Amazon. Uh, link will be in the show notes. Now, thank Cara, you. thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, if people are interested to connect with you and perhaps ask you a couple of questions, where should they go to? I'm all over social media at Kara Golden with an, with an I. And uh, I would love to hear from you. Also, the book is on Audible, too, if that's your choice. Um, to, uh, I read the book and, uh, and through for the Audible version. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Very cool. Also available on Kindle. I got the Kindle version, the physical version. Um, it's all good. And grab yourself a bottle of Hint, uh, Hint water as well. Drinkhint.com is where you should go to. Um, Kara, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the e-commerce profits podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get notified of future episodes.